Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Future of African Family Business. This afternoon, we're joined by Heinz Peter Elstrott. Um, Heinz is an active advisor and member of boards of directors of many family businesses. He's also a guest lecturer at London Business School and in SEAD. You're welcome, Heinz. Well, thank you for the introduction. It's a great pleasure uh, to speak to you all. Uh, I think I have half an hour. So this is a, what I'm going to talk about is a short introduction to the field of family business. It's actually a, a synthesis of an introduction of a, of a, to one week course. So it's like a 1%. We hope we can talk about the other 99% at some point. Um, but it's a, it's a bit, um, comes also goes back to my own journey with family business, which started like 30 years ago. I was living in, uh, in Latin America most of the last 30 years. So I was mostly working with founders and second generation companies who were young companies, very energetic, but quite doubtful actually about their future. You know, this is why I entitled the talk, the first hundred years are the most difficult because it's the first kind of two transitions from the founder to the second and then to the third generation, which is the most difficult. After that, it gets a bit easier. So, so at that time, I started to research uh, old companies, which were more than 150 years old and large. So the first article I ever wrote on, on family business was about that. Found like 15 around the world. I visited them all. And we, we, you know, that's how, how research started. It was most helpful to see how these four, five, six, seven generations company manage themselves. Answers everybody does it differently, but there are some common themes also. So anyway, so my own journey started with that, uh, with young companies trying to perpetuate themselves, but being quite skeptical whether that's actually possible because statistics are against you. You know, if you all look around in your own environments, your own cities or communities or countries, and think about who were the leading family businesses like 20, 40, 50 years ago, and who are they today, uh, typically is very different, you know? So the old ones die, the young ones come up. That is normal in a way, of course, in any economy that happens. But in family business, it's often self-inflicted because of uh, we, we mess it up with the, with, the, with, the, with the successions, okay? So it's often unnecessary, in my experience, and can be avoided. And we can learn a lot from what happened in the global economy the last 200 years. So this is where I came from. And um, I will try to answer three questions very briefly. And I will share the screen. I hope that works. Here we are. Okay. Oh, here we are. Seems to work. So just give you a feel of the relevance of family business, FB is family business, the global economy. And how are they doing? That's the first two questions. And then how make it successful? I will spend most of the time on the third question. The first two questions I just want to put out because coming from emerging markets as I do and, and you do, um, if you come to London or New York and talk to the you know, leaders of the capital markets here, they would say, you know, what is family business? Well, family business is something from the 19th century. If you look at, you know, the U.S., of course, you had the Carnegie's, the Rockefellers and whatnot. And, um, and uh, but it's a form of ownership that what the, the capital market guys would say, it's a form of ownership, which, uh, which of course, you know, is, is important because it, it founds, it, it creates new things. But then goes quickly away and gives away to public companies, which are institutional investors own, and that is the much better form of ownership anyway, okay? Uh, and, and that will happen in the emerging markets also, so we shouldn't be overly, you know, concerned about dealing with family business. They're kind of typically mom and pop shops, but even, shops, but even those get franchised or, or chained or put into chains or whatnot. So that is a bit the prevailing consensus um, if you will come to London or New York, and it is uh, fundamentally wrong. You know, and this is just my message here. It's, it's complete nonsense because uh, the role of family business, and I'm not talking small, but also ma uh, medium, large family business in the global economy is actually huge all, all over the world, not only in the emerging markets. And it's growing, and, and most people don't know that. So so I think I, I make this point just to, just to you know, we are all, you're all interested, I guess, in family businesses while listening to this webinar and, and either from family business or working with family business. So we should we should know that we should be conscious of, of how important that phenomenon is. That's point one. I will give you just some numbers very quickly. And the second point is how they're doing. I will get to these these thing also because there's the, the uh, there's often, a, you know, it, it is it is a widely researched issue and it's not easy to, to answer, but I will, I will get to that. So just on the first one, uh, you know, just some facts which which you might know 
or not, but if, if not, hopefully it's interesting. You know, family business create like 79% of the global GDP, that's a lot. And, and it's not only small companies, you know. Um, if you look at Europe, this is continental Europe, not the UK where I live. I live in London now. The UK, they, they sold mostly everything. But, but if you look at continental Europe, Germany being the biggest economy, but also France, Italy, all the uh, Mediterranean economies, 40% um, of the major publicly traded companies in Europe are family controlled. So over the top thousand continental Europe com European companies, like 40% are family companies. Around a fifth of the global Fortune 500. Global Fortune 500 is a very, you know, a very big companies. A family owner. This number is growing quite fast. This is very counterintuitive. And again, if you talk to London, if you talk to people here in London, I had a big fight with the Economist once. There's a journalist from the Economist, great guy, but he say, you know, there, there cannot be many family firms in the global Fortune 500. If they are, they probably will fade away. And they're saying, okay, they, the families sell out. They don't know how to deal with it, and then it's it's a publicly traded, uh, fragmented fragmented company and the opposite is the case so so actually the the, the numbers of, of of large global 500 family companies is is growing quite significantly okay uh in india you know 50 percent in brazil korea brazil mexico a third of the largest companies are family owned. in the gcc that's a it's in the gulf I, I i used to work a lot in 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 all these countries actually in the gulf in india uh korea brazil mexico not, didn't make it much to Africa, unfortunately, other than to Lagos and Nairobi for some workshops. But but um, all these all these emerging market economies, of course, you know, not only the small companies which are family firms everywhere in the world, but also the medium big ones are, and also in Europe and even in the US, the number is not on here, but it's like twenty five percent. So this is a large phenomenon. It's a growing phenomenon. It's not a shrinking phenomenon. I think that is very important as a fundamental message. And how are they doing? Okay, how are we doing in this in, in, in the, with the family businesses? Are they better performing, less performing? Are they more or less resilient? There's a lot of research on that, and it's not all totally conclusive. Okay, so I just quote one research. Uh, this is a Credit Swiss report, which is actually quite well done. Sometimes investment banks do reports which are not not very well researched, but this is actually quite 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 well done. Uh, which 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 research the top thousand family business in the world. So across all kinds of countries, uh, you know, African, you know, Latin American, European, American, Chinese, Indian companies, and they do peer groups. So they say, okay, if this is a consumer company uh, in Kenya or whatever, or a chemical company in India, what would be the peer group to compare with? Which is the right way to research? Uh, because uh, family businesses are not evenly spread across all sectors. You have some sectors where family businesses are very prominent, like retail, for example, or consumer goods, and where they are less prominent, like uh, infrastructure, telecommunication, or whatnot. So you have to form peer groups, and then they make a longer-term analysis, 12-year analysis. It's quite just two business cycles, which is not bad. And they come to the conclusion that they outperform the peers by 700 basis points per year. That's a lot of outperformance, okay? And it's across all industries and regions. It is even, you know, and that is very, very important for our discussion here. It, it's not, the outperformance is not limited to the owners because everybody would say, okay, a founder company, which comes from nothing, and it gets founded by somebody and creates something. Obviously, it has to have a higher rate of growth than other companies, otherwise it wouldn't exist. But this outperformance also continues in ownership of the second and third generation. And they, they could figure that out. So that's very important. The outperformance goes down a little bit, but but it still remains. So this is a pretty good report. If you can read it, 2019, they didn't do it. I don't know whether 2020, uh, the report came already out. I'm sorry. But this is 12-year report. That's, that's quite good. An interesting question, by the way, is always when you have this big crisis, like now we have the pandemic, um, how family business are doing with others, OK? We don't know what the pandemic will bring. We will know this in a couple of years. But just one word, if you look at the 2008-9 crisis, the big global financial crisis, family firms came out much stronger than other firms out of that crisis for a very simple reason. Uh, the simple reason is they're more conservative typically, which also this research shows and as other research, but, but this also shows they are less leveraged financially. So if there's a big crisis, they, they are less likely to go under. So their survival rate is higher. So family firms actually are doing very well. Now, the other thing is, while they are doing very well, uh, there is a big issue with um, long-term survival, as is with any firm, by the way. You know, most firms don't survive a long time. But family firms have obviously something going for them, and we will talk about what that is and how can you 
preserve that and strengthen that and avoid the pitfalls. We'll talk about that in a second. But somehow, you know, the, the successions don't work. So, you know, third or fourth generation, very, very few family families, fam, family business ever get there. And that's just a statistical phenomenon. And I told you in the beginning, if you look around in your community, your countries, and think about 20, 50 years ago, make a list. And today, it's typically very different, you know. And, and many of these family farms who, who, who faded away, they didn't fade away because the business model was outdated or something like that, because the family uh, kind of messed it up, if you want. So, so, so this is what we are going to talk about in the, in the rest of this talk. And first thing, you know, what is it actually which makes family businesses stronger business than non-family business or can make it potentially? Can family business, what are the factors which can, uh, which drive family business and the success of those? So uh, we, we call this um, uh, uh, the family capital. Family capital is not money, is the intangible factors, if you want so, which, which contribute to the success. The first is the stewardship notion. You all have heard about this if you deal with family businesses, the idea of, you know, I'm not an owner really, or I can do whatever I want with my asset or my company. I'm a steward and have to steer it through the times. I have a transition, you know, I have a certain period where I'm in charge, but then I hand it over to other people, maybe to my own offspring or to whomever. But I have to hand it over stronger to other people than I got it, you know. And that notion of stewardship is long-term thinking. You know, this is a bright side on the left. So family is based a lot on values. Uh, puts the firm's interest first. Say, I'm, I'm here in the transition. In, I'm, we're always in transitions, right? But the firm might may exist longer than I do. So let's, let's take the firm interest first and puts a long-term view. The one thing which, which scholars typically would quote, which family businesses do better than non-family business, is just long-term view. It's not a quarterly view. It is a, a you know decayed view, which which makes very different. We have a lot of research which says publicly uh, traded companies, particularly in the U.S., uh, you know they will not do. There are a lot of good research that the majority will not do very profitable investments if these profitable investments mean that they won't meet their next quarter's earnings targets. They just won't invest. This is why they have all this cash uh, and not investing very much, even although they're making a lot of money. So so there is a there is a big um, there is a big uh, disincentive for, for long-term thinking in the public company, and the families typically can overcome that. Now, the stewardship notion, we should always say, you know, things can go right and things can go wrong, you know, and, and there is a negative to it, which is often authoritative leadership. So I'm the steward of this, so I do, you know, I have to call the shots and I don't listen to anybody else. Overattachment, which is very important because if you want to create a long-term business, you have to change the business all the time because the economies are changing all the time. So the only way to survive is to change a bit faster than the economy is changing, actually. And these days, the economy is changing in strange and wonderful ways or, you know, horrendous ways, whatever you wanted to call it, but in very unforeseeable and volatile ways. So you have to be ahead of the curve, which means you, you cannot be overly attached to what you have today. You have to think about what's what you need for tomorrow. And risk averseness is also something of stewardship particularly in, 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 in follow generation, not the founders who are typically a bit more risk, open to risk, otherwise they wouldn't found a business in the first place, but the heirs, because they don't want to lose what they have, you know, so in not losing what I have, being very attached to what I have can be, uh, can be very deadly, okay, so, so too much risk averse is not good. I'll give you just a simple example of a media company I know very well, they had to move from, from analog from, to digital media, that's the, and, and the only way they could do is that they would take a whole generation of, this is an older company, a whole generation of owners out and put young people in because otherwise the, the older people just couldn't, couldn't do it because they were too risk averse. They wanted to preserve the dividends. They didn't want to make crazy investments into internet companies and so on. So that put the whole company at risk because we were too risk averse. So stewardship is something family firms have going for them. Family identity, you know, identification with the family business. It's your name on the on the door if you want so the ownership image reputation is very important coming from emerging markets in my case you know latin america um it's very different than than living in europe or the us because often you live in political environments which are very tricky you know you have a lot of corruption and all these uh, terrible things and so what i noticed and what actually attracted me being a german uh to to family business in latin america was um that these families, they have a huge, uh, not all of them, but, but many of them, you know, have to think very carefully about their values, their reputation, because they know that they live in a society, an environment, political, economic environment, 
which is not value based at all. You know, so there are many bad things going on all the time. So they think about the reputation, the image, and they want to position themselves as very different. Great example, by the way, is Tata Group in India, you know, the, the leading family firm in India that have been doing this for 150 years. India is a very corrupt country. And they have this thing that they never go never go into anything of that kind. And everybody knows that. And as everybody knows that, people don't even ask. So, so you know, the, the creating something of value and reputation for yourself in, in difficult environments, this is what successful family companies do. But the family identity also has a negative. Everything, too much of a good thing is always a bad thing, right? So it can be very introvert, introverted. So sometimes families, particularly if they get larger, they sit around the table, look at each other, but they don't look outside enough. You know, that's a, that's a risk. It can be a lack of in, uh, innovation also. Then you have the tribal notion. The tribal notion is a, is a word from the evolution of psychology, which says, you know, human beings, uh, uh, when, we, when we started out, as human beings, we, we, we are living in tribes and tribes are small groups. And often you see family business are really like tribes. So this is not only the family, it's also non-family managers who work together. You know, and they have a very strong commitment to each other and a lot of trust. And trust is very, very important because it, it reduces transaction costs enormously. So the, you see this in many family firms. This is a, this notion of we are in this together and it's a close knit group. That has also negatives, for example, if you look at boards of family companies, they are much less diversified than boards of non-family companies because the tendency is to have kind of friends and and close, you know, uh, close uh, relatives and, and family uh, friends on there, but 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 not being not being too diversified, which is bad, you know. So all of these positive factors can also go negative. And trust, I already talked about this. You have high trust, open environments. You can also have blind trust, you know. Have Unfortunately, I know quite a number of firms who, who put in CEOs and then the CEOs did things they didn't know and it, it went very badly. So, so you shouldn't, you know, you need also some controls. But these are the four things, stewardship, family identity, tribe and trust, which actually have the family business have going for them. Now, um, if you do too much of it, again, it gets to be a bad thing. So let's talk about the key thing. And this is my last chart, I promise, but it, it will take a little bit of time to explain it which is this journey of the first 100 years, you know? So what is journey of the first 100 years? The journey of the first 100 years is going from the first generation, owner manager who creates something, uh, maybe one person, maybe also a group of person. And, you know, there's quite a number of companies who get uh, created by, by, or by, by families or siblings or brothers, sisters, or by, by partners, you know, two, three partners who create something. Although this is quite rare, mostly it's an individual uh, who does it. And then uh, it goes to the second and to the third generation. When it goes to the fourth generation, you're already 100 years already gone. So, so why is it so difficult to make these journeys? Okay. So I will go a little bit into this and hope shed some light on it, which hopefully you find helpful for your own journeys. Um, first of all, one of the roadblocks uh, for the owners, owner managers typically are not much aware of, um, uh, of how to make something perpetual. And, and that's quite logical actually if you think about it, because somebody who founds a business I, I never met anybody who said i will found a family business i mean people found businesses okay and then later on after let's say the thing has gone well and it has been growing and now it's something quite substantial and they're getting older then they have to think about what to do with it but it's not the way they think about it people want to create something they don't they don't think about perpetuating something and this mindset shift Mindset, mindset shift from building a business to building an institution to perpetuating something is a very complicated mindset shift because it's it's a very different philosophy. You know, if I build something, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm opportunistic. I go here, I go there, try this, try that, and and see things with other people don't see opportunities which other people don't perceive, and I go there and take a risk and go. But it's very much a step by step process, and and if I do it right, I build, I build, I build, I build, get some to something substantial. The institution building is the opposite thinking, you know. It requires to say, I will take myself out of the picture, which means we have to deal with our own mortality, which is difficult for many people. And what happens then if I'm not there, you know, and I cannot be there tomorrow. I mean, everybody, we all will, will die. So uh, so what happens then? How can I prepare the company for, for the period after myself? So first thing, I have to think long term, because hopefully we will be around for a couple of years to come. Uh, and then think backwards, you know, what can I do between today and this 
this moment when I'm out, either hopefully voluntarily out because I decide to retire and do something different in life than, than doing business, or, or involuntarily. So, so what, what are the steps I have to do? So it's a very different kind of thinking. It's not opportunistic at all. It is having a vision how this thing is going to work and then going towards that. And this involves different dimensions that most people don't think about these dimensions. The first is ownership. Who will own the company? You know, should I give it to a philanthropy? Should I give it to my kids? Should I sell it and then put a family office, give it to the managers or do a management buyout or whatnot? So I have many options on ownership. I have many options on governance. I have many options on who runs it. I have many options on strategy. So I have to think through these dimensions. Ownership always comes first. Okay. And most people don't think about that. Then governance and management and strategy. Okay. So what do I want to see when I'm no longer there? And, and, and this kind of thinking is many founders find that very difficult. And, and few have this uh, bit more enlightened mind who says, okay, you know, let's think about this. And making this switch is just very, very difficult. So we have to help the founders to do that. You know, and if the founders happen to be, for example, your mothers or fathers, <laughs> it's a difficult discussion to have. But it's very possible, you know, because they all want good uh, for the long term, they just you know have some barriers in themselves, and also lack of skills because the the, the again the, the skill you need to build an institution is very different than the skill you need to build a business. So you have to be humble also in a way because if people are very successful, they might get arrogant. They think they can do anything. That's typically wrong. So you have to be humble uh, uh, how to do that. And sometimes, of course, you have lack of neck capability or commitment from the next generation. There are quite a number of founders who just leave the kids out totally. Uh, until they suddenly say, oh, you know, what, what do I do now? And then at this point, the next generation is already, you know, they're adults, they do all kinds of things, they have no idea about the business, and then it's a bit late. So you have to have this fine balance, you know, of involving the next generation, making them conscious of what the business is without forcing them to do things. It's a very fine line. And most people are more radical. They are 100% you know, out, and these things typically don't work. So... So the next generation is, is tricky here. So how to overcome these roadblocks? Um, the first thing is, i tell you a short story. Um, I once ran a workshop that was in Oman, actually. Um, and the, I, the, the question was exactly that, you know, successful founder transitions. And we took two examples. We had a group of 30 family business from around the world. And we took two examples. One was a founder actually from the Middle East. Uh, he, he had founded a business. He was like early 50s. And the business was big, had like 20,000 employees. So as a, you know, in, in Iraq, Iran, strange, you know, in, in the middle of the wars, he did that very, very interesting fellow. And the other was a friend of mine, a German, who is a chairman of a big family company, seventh, eighth generation. So his four, four, four father in the 18th century actually created the company. And we asked both the same question. We asked, you know, the, the German guy, we said, oh, so your great, great, great grandfather, why was he successful where many others failed? What, what, what differentiated him as a founder? And then we asked the guy from the Middle East who was in his early 50s, what are you doing? Because we knew that he already had thought a lot about his own succession, although he was quite young. And the fascinating thing was that they said exactly the same thing. So the guy in the 18th century in Germany and the guy in the 21st century in Iraq, they were thinking exactly the same way. And they said, look, if you're like 50 or something, at some point, you have to think about values about people. That's really what you have to focus about. You have to kind of delegate the business. You have to have to think about your values. Why do you do this? What's the significance? What is the purpose? And you have to think about the people who want you want to lead it after you leading it, be it family or non-family. So in both cases, these people with 50 start to really spend the most of their time articulating values and, and coaching and building a group of people who would succeed them. You know, so quite early, you know, and, and that worked. Now, most people don't do that, and then it doesn't work. So this is how to overcome this roadblock. Constructing sibling library, I mean, we know from all ages and uh, that siblings always there is a rivalry. That's a biological necessity, I guess. And how do you, how do you manage that, you know? And um, I can only say one thing. Uh, I, I love sibling groups if they're very very heterogeneous, they all are, you know, so you have sisters, brothers, and they might be all over the place with all, all kinds of different personalities. But if, if, if you can convince the sibling group to reflect on who I am and who is my sister, my brother, what do they bring to the party? What's their good points? What their strengths? What their weaknesses? You can create a great team, okay? Because you will have a diverse group of people who builds the best team. So I'll give you an example of a group I love. Four siblings, they inherited a small company 
um, from their father who, who passed away early. And they were quite unprepared to do that. But then over 30 year period, so we have to, family business, you always have to look long term. They created a big global company. And how did they do that? And they would say very simple, you know, we were for very different people. You know, there was one who was extremely introverted, but he loved machines, not people really. So he was an industrial guy. This is an industrial company. There was a gambler. There was the oldest, you know, who, who loves to gamble and, 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 and negotiate. So he was a commercial guy. There was a, a guy who loved people and was very extroverted and expansive. So he made them, they made him the chairman and CEO. And he was in charge of strategy and people. And there was a guy who loved numbers and more than anything else. So he was a finance guy. So these four guys, although they bought a lot of different businesses over the years, all over the globe, they had a lot of CEOs, but they never, ever, never, ever took any individual decision as a sibling. They always said, you know, one brings financial perspective, one brings industrial perspective, one brings commercial perspective, uh, perspective, one brings people and strategy perspective, and we sit together and fight it out. And they really fight it out. When I, when I entered the first time the room with these four guys, <laughs> I thought it was kind of a war going on because shouting at each other, and door slamming and stuff. But this is the way they took decisions because they knew that they had totally different views on anything. And that was a great strength, not a weakness. Okay, so how, how to make that sibling the heterogeneity of the siblings which is normal in any family how to make this a strength and not a weakness this is really how to overcome the, the roadblocks of the siblings and you start to uh, structure a little bit more already then when you go to the siblings to the cousins it's a totally different ball game and this is very important because uh, one one rule for the first hundred years is when you have a transition, you have to change pretty much everything. Okay, nothing stays the same in terms of governance, in terms of strategy, in terms of management. Nobody will succeed the founder. You know, if you're a founder, you know the business from 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 nothing, from the from the very early days. So founders typically know much more about the business than their managers or the next generation or anybody. You cannot substitute this role. You can split it up. You can have a chairperson. You can have a CEO. You can have an owner. You can have different roles, but. Nobody will succeed a founder. So, so everything has to be you know, very, very different and much more fragmented and, and, and structured because if you have more people involved, you need more structure. And this is even more true from the second or the third generation because you have more family members involved. If you have cousins involved, there typically will be quite a number of people who don't know much about the business, but they might be shareholders. So you have a tension between people in the business and outside the business, which is a big tension because some might want dividends, some might want growth, and you have all kinds of different objective functions. You typically have the governance not prepared. Sibling governance is still very trust-based. Siblings grow up in the same household. You know, they, they know each other from, from, from birth. Uh, so they don't need much governance, much structure, but then you cousins need a lot of structure, you know. Then you have this thing that not all siblings behave the way I just, my, from my example, that they leverage different talents, but most of them kind of split it up. So if you have different businesses, you run this, I run that but we own it together. So we are kind of partners, but we also not, you know, and that's very tricky. Cousins can't do that. There are lots of conglomerates, particularly in India, I've seen that a lot, but also in other countries um, uh, that, that, you know, second generation, they run different parts of the group, but then comes the cousins and it just doesn't work because you have to put this whole thing together again, you know, which is very difficult. And the family will be much more divergent. So it gets much complex, you know, and the, and the only way to get out of this conundrum is really share, you know, shared vision and values. Then you have to spend a lot of time on bringing people on the same page, on aligning people on what's our vision, where do we want to go, what are our values, and very a lot of structure, you know, defining the role of the family, what's the role of the family, role of the owners, role of the board. You know, regardless how big the company is, you, if you have people not involved in the business who are owners, you need structure, you need governance. You know, so this is where a lot of the structure comes in and then it gets complex. You might need a board of directors, you might need a family council, you might need policies for, uh, for, fam for exit. You know, if somebody wants to get out, how you get out, you know, without destroying the company. Employment in the company, should we employ family members in the company or not? What are the rules? All this stuff, which is, uh, you know, the, is, is a big, there's a huge amount of examples, literature concepts for that. But all this you need at this point. And again, why do people not do this? Although it seems quite obvious to us, because for the siblings, it's not obvious because the siblings often didn't need that. And they think it's just useless bureaucracy. So they're against it. So then the cousins have to fight their, their mothers and fathers and uncles and aunts. Say, look, what you did will not work for us. We, we have different needs and we have to do it differently. You know? And this is always this thing about transitions. Typically, if you have a very enlightened older generation, they will kind of uh, uh, take the initiatives by themselves. This is kind of 
if it's 10%, it's a lot, I think it's less. So the initiative has to come from the next generation who has consciousness and says, look, um, this is all great, but the way it worked for my, you know, mother, father, aunt, uncle, whatever, is not going to work for me. So we have to have a different system. And then convince your peer group and convince the older generation that change is needed. And that's a difficult process. And this is why most of these processes don't work. And this is then why most of these family firms fail, which is very sad because, as I said, it is um, it is a great uh, group of uh, ownership. It's, it's a great form of ownership. It's growing in the world, so it's doing very well. But many family firms fail because of they, they, they cannot make this, uh, these transitions work. But the good news is, you know, if you get over the first 100 years, it gets easier. When we research the 150, 200 years companies, after the third generation, the systems don't change very much. You know, they are very interesting companies who have been around for 200 years and, and have a thousand family members. You know, this is 2,000. There's a German one I know well, Hanya, they have a thousand. There's a French, uh, which has 2,000 family members. Um, and, and it works. You know, it works because they found a way to do it, okay, which, which is their own way. But they found it roughly in the third generation. And then when there were a couple of dozens, maybe, and then it grows to 50 or 100, doesn't make such a big difference. But this first, you know, these first hundred years are difficult, and this is what I wanted to make a short, uh, give you a short summary, and I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Heinz, for that um, insightful presentation, and. I think it look it is it's a roadmap to um, looking at building a, a hundred year uh, family firm, and a lot of the issues that you brought up in terms of people actually understanding um, that family firms are some of the biggest corporations and um, Fortune five hundred companies out there. It's um, I think. It's, uh, the mind block comes in that when people think family um, firms or family uh, businesses, they're thinking of your mom and pop shop. They're thinking of where the beginning of the story. They're not really focusing on the end of the story. And um, your presentation helped us navigate from the beginning and working its way right to what the, um, the development and a, a, a a bigger family business look like as well as the complications that go with it. Mm -hmm. So um, the, one of the first questions we have is what is the most common mistakes family businesses face when moving from generation one to generation two and what should they do or uh, what can they do that can help circumvent these mistakes? Well, I think when I talked about the two founders from my examples, you know, who in their 50s decided that they will no longer, that they will delegate much of the business functions and focus on values and people, okay? That is very rare, okay? That doesn't happen very much, okay? So I think that the, the most, the biggest pitfall is that people just keep on doing, 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 doing until they get quite old. And, and they never really get around this question of, how do I, can I build something which survives me, you know? And psychologically speaking, you might even speculate, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but psychologists tell me that people might actually, they're not, they might don't mind this, although they wouldn't admit that, that the firm dies with them because I think they're the only one who can do it. <laughs> so there's a certain pride in this. So I think to, you have to have that dialogue, you know, with the founder, you have to change the founder's mindset. That is the key thing, okay? And, and, and most of these founders are wonderful people and they, they, want, they want to have success for their family or for whoever will own the company in the long term, but they just can't do it, you know, because they don't have the, the skills and they don't want to face up to their own mortality or, their, or, or getting older and so on. So to have that dialogue in a way which is acceptable for the founder, that is, I think, the tricky thing. It is very difficult. It's often very difficult for, 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 for the kids to do it, you know, because, you know, sometimes it works, but, but mostly it doesn't, you know. And, and, and you have to have that dialogue and, and, and have to say, look, let's focus on a picture. Uh, let's paint a picture where you are no longer present. 
because this is just this is just fact of life. You know, you will not be present. Hopefully, because you you know, want to retire, do something else. Uh, many many people have you know retire early and do something else. This is also very smart. You know, I know quite a number of people who retired early and say, I, you know, I've worked for 20, 30 years. That's enough, and they went on doing whatever you know, art or politics or philanthropy or what have you. But but take yourself out of the picture. What do you want to see and answer that question? You know, that, that is, this is a trick. It's, it, it is a very answerable question. It's technically not that difficult. You know, it's, it's difficult from a human point of view. So we have to have that dialogue with the founder. I think that is the biggest bottleneck. Excellent points. And obviously we're in 2021 and we're still living through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what have you seen? What's been the impact of um, the pandemic on family businesses and what are the lesson points that they can take from this season to position themselves for the future? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. And of course, it is a speculative question at this point, but uh, I mentioned that uh, if you look at past crises, you know, that family business typically came out better than non-family business out of these crises. I mentioned the, the global financial crisis 2008-9, we, family business is better for the simple reason that they were less leveraged. Typically, family business are financially more conservative because they don't want to go bankrupt. <laughs> so the de- bankruptcy risk is very different for, for an owner than for a manager. Okay, so because you lose much more. So, so uh, that helped them in the global financial crisis. If you look at the pandemic, I think it's very hard to predict. I think it's not clear whether family business get better out of this because one way of thinking why not is the following uh we live in a world which is very unpredictable and volatile i mean if you happen to own an airline for example you might be bankrupt by now you know or, <laughs> you know if you owned a pharmaceutical company you, you made a huge windfall so you know but it's totally unpredictable so if you think we live in a world which is very unpredictable and and very volatile then actually uh being non-diversified as an owner is a pretty bad thing, okay? So typically family business owners, uh, they might be richer or not so rich, but they have a certain wealth. And so typically this wealth is not diversified, most of it in one, one, one company, right? So if you think you live in a world which is totally unpredictable, you have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, then that might be a pretty bad idea. You know, it might be better to sell it and diversify your portfolio. So. The question of diversification in a volatile world, I think this is a question which will stay with us quite a long time, you know, because if, if this is kind of the, if the new normal is I have no idea what's going to happen, then it's not such a good idea to be very uh, kind of focused on, on, on one one company because that's, it's things that we, we all think, you know, that we have more control than we really have. Okay. But the pandemic showed us how little we have. <laughs> okay. So and if, you, if you get more conscious, how little control we actually have about the future, be it our own or our company or whatever, you know, we might be a bit thinking, you know, um, maybe I should diversify more. And then that might lead people to sell the business and put the money in a family office or something like that. So I don't know whether that's going to happen, you know, but I think in contrast to other f- crises we have seen in the past, from this one, I'm not so sure whether it will be helpful for family firms for that reason. Okay, but we have to see, oh, it's early times. There is some, there's a little uh, research on that it came out in the Harvard Business Review in the middle of last year, which they asked the families whether actually this pandemic has strengthened or weakened the family uh, coherence, if you want so, you know, and it was 50-50. So some people said they got in a lot of fights because whatever, you know, maybe they had invested at the wrong time or the weather, the wrong business or whatnot. And others say that they helped us a lot to, 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 to come together even stronger. So it's very unclear. So I, I, don't, I don't have a crystal ball on that one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and um, I think the second last question is looking at um, the 100-year families, the families that have managed to move from generations to generation and have multiple cousins now working together running the family. What have you seen has been the most successful model? A model where the ownership of the company is diluted and you have shareholders that are non-family members or a model where the family continues as a holistically family-owned business with more family uh, members as owners, even though 
there's that diversity of different households. And obviously with that cousin consortium, we've got different families um, holding those shares. Well, okay, these are two questions. Okay, one is um, should, should family firms, um, I, 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 I cut this in two, okay? One, I have a family firm. What happens inside the family, ownership inside the family? That's one question. The other is beyond the family, should we have partners? Okay, should we, you know, uh, sell a stake to a private equity fund or get other partners in or do go public at some point and so i think there is a one one answer is easier than the other okay i think there's a good argument to make that it is helpful for older family firms to have a partner you know to be to be to be not 100 percent or not own 100 percent. okay and the reason for that is that it keeps you honest, you know, it helps you over family conflict, it, if it's a good partner, obviously, you know, it forces some governance. So I, I know quite a number of family firms who have been around for a long time and who sold, say, 20% to a private equity fund or to an outside investor, not because they needed the money, they didn't need the money, but they wanted to have somebody who helps them to construct better governance and to get over some of these family issues. You know, say, guys, we have a partner, we have to behave. So. It's a it's a mechanism to dis discipline the family. Okay, so having a minority partners, be it whoever it is, who are good partners and help you—that's a good thing. I believe that is actually a good thing. Okay, um, uh, but also you have to keep the majority because what doesn't work is also something which often happens, particularly in the U.S. Actually, uh, that you have a small share of the company but you control it. I mean, the U.S. have this A and B shares, other other. In a way, A share has 10 votes per share, B share has one vote. So with 5%, you control 50% of the vote. That's a bad thing, okay? So there is kind of a sweet spot. I like the word sweet spot in family business because there's always too much of a good thing is a bad thing. You should have a substantial stake, say 40, 60, 80%, but having a partner is a good thing. The second question is in the family, you know, how do you transfer ownership? And of course, there are two extremes. One is uh, the old model, you know, primogeniture. I mean, that's what the Greeks and the Romans did, what the Europeans did until the French Revolution, then it changed. You know, the oldest son gets everything. And in some cultures, you still have that, China, you know, in particular. Uh, that doesn't work, you know, uh, because, you know, there's no way to say that the oldest son or the oldest children is necessarily the best owner. That's, that's nonsense. The other is just fragmentation. That actually, that notion came in from from the actually from the Islamic law, if you want to, because they first to split it not evenly, but yes, they split it among all the children, which was not the case in the West until the until the 18th century. And then, you know, through the French Revolution and later on in Europe, and then spreading around the world, we had this you know equality issue. You know, every everybody gets equal share. And then you, of course, you come to families after seven generations have a thousand members. So, what's the better model? That is very hard to say. You know, that is very hard to say. I think partly. Many families don't have the choice anyway, because there's legal restrictions. Each country has its own laws on how to do that. You know, some laws are more restricted. You know, some laws are more open. Um, I think if you have a mechanism to keep the group relatively a bit smaller is better. So if you can buy out uh, members who don't want to be part of this, because that always happens, you know, you might always have siblings or cousins who really are not motivated by this, who do not really buy into the values and the mission and the purpose. If you have that, then better, you know, let them go. So pruning the family, the ownership tree is a good thing, you know. Now that of course hurts the business because you use capital, which you could use for other things, you know. So that's a tricky, it's a very tricky route. You know, I know quite a number of family members where you say the second generation, one branch left and third generation is two branches left, but then you need a lot of money to buy them out. And then the business cannot grow for 10 years. So it's a very fine trade off of, of pruning the family tree a little bit, which is good, but not spending too much capital on this, which really hurts the business. Or you have to put a lot of debt to buy them out and then you have a crisis that you go bankrupt. This happens, okay? So it's unfortunate. <laughs> so I would say uh, that the family has a bit of an outside partner. Minority partner is a good thing typically because it helps in the governance. Inside the family, it's a lot legally driven mostly really. Uh, I don't have, I think you can live with fragmented ownership is not a problem, you know, if, but you have to invest then a lot into the family and a lot into the values and a lot into the alignment and a lot into the education. Everybody needs to be an expert in governance. If I'm an owner, if, if I'm involved in the business or not, doesn't make any difference. You know, it's, I have to, everybody you know, has to understand how the governance really works, you know, on the, on the shareholder level and on the, on the company level. So then you can live as fragmented ownership, but you have to have a way to prune the family tree. It's not the family tree, the ownership tree. 
because you have to have an escape valve so that people can get out if, if, if they should get out. And that's a whole philosophy, you know, it's another lecture of many hours, how you actually structure this so that you can let people out without hurting the business or the other people who stay. That, that is a big issue, you know, which, which, which we know a lot about actually, so many solutions to it. But we, we have to, we have, we need that. We need, we have to, we need the, the ability to, to prune the family tree. Wow, thank you so much, Heinz. This has been a really enriching um, educational session with you this afternoon. Should anyone wish to get in touch with you, how best can they reach you? Oh, you can, you can uh, um, give my, my email, you know, at, from, from, from London Business School, that, that's an easy one. I also can share the slides, it's not a problem. This is all, okay. I use this all in my, my lecture, so that's uh, nothing, nothing. I can, uh, there are lots of articles uh, which I've written, so people, if they want to read something about the 200 years old businesses or, or the founder transition or the, the second or third generation transition, there are some nice articles about nice, I hope they're nice. But they're, at least they are short, you know, I didn't write a book because I'm not, I'm not patient enough, but I think to read articles is easier <laughs> to read a book anyway. So people can read if they're interested or they can email me. Is, uh, I'm, I'm always uh, happy to, to think. I mean, what I most like is to engage with people to talk about their issues, not talk about what I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much um, for your time. Thank you all. Thank you all.